Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Fear Tab. Shall we crack on? Um, Let's. Actually, having said that, before we do, uh, two bits of public thanks to get around to because we haven't done one of these in forever. Uh, Laurel is a brand new Patreon subscriber. So thank you very much, Laurel, and welcome aboard. Um, And... uh, Patreon.com slash Lexitecture. Hashtag always be plugging. For those of you who want to know what the fuss is about. <laughs> Hashtag Ryan's so much better at this than I am. <laughs> I always go, oh, that's so awesome. How lovely. These people are so great. <laughs> oh, yeah, more people could. Be, oh, yeah. Well, uh, no, but, but, but the people we have but are so are great. they are so great. It's true. <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing is that, uh, I got in contact uh, somebody contacted me, a student who is heading to Memorial University in Newfoundland by the name of Luca, who came, who just messaged out of the blue and said, hey, you know what I'm great at is transcribing things. And I was like, oh, yeah? Well, good for you, because I'm terrible at it. And the internet is also terrible at it, because we have a Scottish co-host. And Scottish yeah. accents are the bane of all voiced text transcription automation. Uh there must be other there must be other accents out there that suffer the way that the Scots do with automated text, but I, I can't off the top of my head think of yeah, one. Yeah, I would think um, it would be probably the Welsh don't don't get on too well, but it's it does sort of feel like the whole internet might be trolling us sometimes. Yeah, yeah, this is it's like that the the Scottish rage that is has made your people so famous and fearsome is kind of just what we're all after, <laughs> and so. Engineers have designed, they're like, how can we do this in an age where everyone's going to start relying on speech to text? And someone went, I know. Hold on. Wait a second. I've got a plan. Speaking of which, I feel like we've got to discuss Scott's Wikipedia. Oh, yes. Okay. So, sorry. One more thing. So, Luca, just to give proper due. Oh, of course, Luca, the excellent um, Luca. So he got in touch and said, "I do this thing. Would you mind if I transcribed some of your episodes?" And I was like, "I do. I don't understand the question." Um, and we, I didn't. Like, I felt weird. I was like, "I don't want to say yes because then I've sort of asked him to do this thing for which we cannot pay him to do." Uh, but I don't want to say no because I do, in fact, want to say yes. So I did, in fact, say yes, and he did, like, almost immediately was like, here you go, here's the first two. I did them, I don't know, in my sleep, because I'm some sort of superhuman. And uh, yeah, so I, I haven't put them up anywhere yet, but uh, I'm working on that, and the best way to kind of present those so that they can be as effective as we would like them to be. But we mm-hmm. have transcriptions for a couple of our episodes. It's the first two yeah. so far. Uh, but yeah, so thanks, huge thanks to Luca for lending his frankly mystifying talents uh, to this little endeavor. Luca is transcription. (laughs) I, yeah, let's get a theme tune on the go. Um, Luca, you're, you're entirely awesome. And thank you so much for your time. I think that's, that's the thing. Like transcription is something that I've, I've had to go at myself. Uh, I, I had a job once as a, an audio typist and it's incredibly time con- well i find it incredibly time consuming because i suck at typing um but but yeah it's it's really really wonderful to have transcriptions for for all sorts of reasons and yeah we're we're incredibly mm-hmm. grateful uh so yes scott scott's wikipedia scott's wikipedia man <laughs> yeah did, did did you have a look did you go and check I, it out i didn't actually go check it out because i sort of felt like i had i mean first of all i I, I do not know Scots. So I felt like me actually looking at it would be a little bit like, you know, someone is like, can you believe these forgeries of late 16th century impressionist masters? And I'd be like, yeah, because I'm dumb. So I would totally I believe mean, it. 
I don't I don't know that you that's actually an interesting point to make like how how many people who don't speak Scots would actually recognize that the vast like the vast majority of Scots Wikipedia uh, is kind of nonsense and my god is it nonsense and like Scots, Scots is a very, very interesting language for lots and lots of reasons. And one of the reasons that we've talked about before is that it's largely been pretty suppressed in, in large parts of Scotland. People are told not to speak Scots, particularly in school, particularly in formal contexts. And so as would happen with any language where, where that has been the case, and you know there are many other examples of this, you, you find that people speak Scots but don't admit to it or know Scots but don't speak it, or mainly speak standard English but occasionally lapse into Scots with the odd word here and there. So it becomes quite a piecemeal kind of affair, given that lots of people don't believe that Scots is a language. And lots of Scottish people don't believe that Scots is a language. And it is, it's, it's recognised by, by the UN and, and you know, there are dictionaries and morphologies and grammars and all that kind of thing. However, um, it, it is quite... Well, I, I saw this via... I actually can't remember where I saw it via. But I, I posted about it and then because language picked it up, either from me posting it or because they saw it somewhere too. Yeah. And they, they posted something about it on Twitter. And I replied to say, I laughed at this a whole lot, but it's actually not very funny. Right. And and it is that it is that way where there's something fucking brilliant about a guy in America somewhere going, you know what? I don't know a thing about this language. I am going to write literally thousands of articles in this language that I do not speak, do not understand, and do not recognise how it works. I'm just going to write thousands of articles. And and the like the original post that I saw was they also mused about how the hell this would have been achieved. Yeah. Because it, it seems that either the articles have been directly translated word from word, word for word from English, which isn't how Scots always works. It's very similar to English in a lot of yeah. ways, but there are there are you know, there's phraseology and syntax that wouldn't be the same. Or it would seem that like a whole lot of Google Translate has been applied. Right. Almost sort of randomly. <laughs> and yeah, that that's th the sheer amount of time and effort that must have gone into that is baffling to me. Yeah, it would be a lot. Like I I don't speak Icelandic. If I wanted to render even a short paragraph into something even vaguely resembling Icelandic that would be hard work for me. Like I, I would need to, to, to really spend some time and, and put some effort in and find some good resources to help me with that. And if what I, what I ended up with wasn't Icelandic, but was sort of vaguely Icelandic shaped, <laughs> I wouldn't think, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to submit that to Icelandic Wikipedia. Well, and I don't like the, there's, yeah, it's the level of effort. Like, I don't edit Wikipedia articles, even if, like, I'm often not spending enough time on Wikipedia to notice errors because I'm, I don't know, I don't know that kind of time on my hands. But even when I do, I kind of go, oh, that's, you know, I'll recognize that. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a little bit off. That's not quite worded properly or that, you know, that citation is dead and doesn't link to anywhere. Or, you know, these other little things. But I won't edit it because it just takes so much time. Like, it's not just a open up the site and click the button and type in your new thing. It's like, it's a process. And so to do that, not only editing, but creating, and like you say, in a language, like, what would possess someone to actually do that is just... <laughs> Yeah, that's oh. that's kind of that's kind of where the interest in this lies for me. Like, I'm I'm sort of pissed off because it, it's incredibly incent culturally insensitive. I think is the very best yeah. you can say about this this approach. 
and and potentially damaging to the notion that Scots is a language, yeah. uh, which you know is is it's that's a discussion that's on the table in in some quarters. But at the same time, I'm just so completely mind blown by the fact that that somebody's spent all this time doing this, and you know you're right. I I do edit articles in Wikipedia, um, largely for typos and you know just just cleaning yeah. up expression yeah. for the most part i got very very excited the other week because i was able to actually add something to wikipedia to a wikipedia article that wasn't there because we started watching the second series the the sort of spin-off of penny dreadful okay it's called penny dreadful city of angels and it features a mexican sort of deity saint uh within the the story that I'd never heard of before. And I looked it up in Wikipedia and discovered that there was a very long and detailed article, but that it didn't mention the fact that this TV show featured this character. So I, I added it in and was, was feeling very pleased with myself because, as I say, usually, like, quite a lot of the editing of Wikipedia that I do comes from my inner pedant that's, you know, quite quite strong and, and quite healthy, <laughs> despite being squished into a drawer quite a lot right. of the time. Um, and And... So I, I always think, like, rather than sitting back going, well, that's not how you spell that word, why not just fix it? You know, that, that seems to be pretty reasonable. And I think a lot of the time, I remember spending quite a long time editing an article that was about um, a big cat that's kept in captivity, I think somewhere in Russia, and it has an Instagram. Okay. Hmm. And it, it seemed fairly obvious to me that the person who had written the article had either direct translated it using a translator or the English was not their native language, which is totally great. Again, you know, I respect the intellectual effort and time and energy that goes into somebody creating that sort of content, but there were a few things that needed cleaned up. So, yeah, I, I will do that if, if need be. But you're right, it, it takes yeah. time. Like, the, the when I was a, a baby student teacher, I was asked to create a unit of work on something, anything I liked. And I decided that... I would create a unit of work on creating a Wikipedia article from scratch with the intention that I might do this one day with a class. And when I started researching what actually has to be done in order to meet the standards for Wikipedia, I realised that I would never, ever do this with a class because the standards were far too stringent and it would be a nightmare to actually get it, you know, get it written and cited yeah. and, and done properly to, to then actually have it be on the site and stay on the site. It's a good site, but the Scots version of it, man, it's, uh, yeah. It's the other thing is just the wasted, like, I mean, now I'm not, I'm not even sure that my mom is listening to this particular episode, but. <laughs> oh, it's always a risk though, like isn't it? She has. <laughs> hey, Judy. Yeah, exactly. Just from me starting to say to lament someone else's wasted potential, my mom has doubled over somewhere. And doesn't know why. Um, but wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry, are you are you talking about this in reference to your good self? I, I am. Yeah. Did did you not just spend the last three years of your life commuting from the moon <laughs> to law school in order to become a lawyer? That's that's generally considered a job that requires well, potential to start uh, off with. Well, well, yes. Thank you for coming to my defense and, from and me. But have have you not now almost pretty much, you know, become a lawyer? You're 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 still I'm an close. articler, articler, articling student. Is that what you say? Articling student, yeah. But you know, unless your brain explodes between now and and bar examinee madness, you know, you're you're going to be a lawyer pretty soon. Yeah, you you met me. We met though, post university. Like, you didn't know high school me? <laughs> high school me, if you'll recall, got scurvy. High school so, you did get scurvy, that's right. So, yeah. But just <laughs> this, this dude doing an entire Scots Wikipedia <laughs> Sorry, anthology. sorry, I have to just, just like, <laughs> likes the texture out there. I know that Ryan edits the episodes and that, that maybe this will never make it into the actual episodes, but can we all just reflect for a minute that while living in a, a first world country in the 90s, Ryan got scurvy. 
Yeah. Not while living on a pirate commune somewhere. No. Not while living on the high seas or being no. isolated from civilization. No, no. Ryan got scurvy in the land of supermarkets. It was the shortest. <laughs> It was the shortest prescription any doctor has ever written me. So like, what do I do? And the doctor was like, "Oranges, just eat a fucking orange once in a while." Like, I I should also point out that <laughs> see that it's it's a funny story that you got scurvy. The fact yeah. that Ryan is not the only Canadian of our age group who got scurvy in around, <laughs> around about the same time. The fact that I know two Canadians who've had scurvy <laughs> makes me laugh almost more than I can possibly communicate to anybody. Uh, yeah. Shout out to you, Mr. Conway. <laughs> <laughs> we really should have got jackets made when we discovered that. We the were in Korea. Twins. It was super cheap to get jackets made there. We totally should have done it. Anyway, yeah. yeah. all I was going to say was just, can you imagine if this guy, this dude that wrote an entire Scots Wikipedia, can you imagine if he applied those, that tenacity and enthusiasm yeah. to something Literally remotely anything else. worthwhile? Like, not even overly beneficial to society, just not negative, not like entirely Trampling irrelevant. on a language. <laughs> it would have been amazing. It should be pointed out also that um, the the Reddit post where I where I found this where you know that this whole situation was revealed to me, I'll, and I'll be perfectly honest. Prior to looking at this Reddit post, I didn't know that Scots Wikipedia existed. So I'm not somebody who's really banging the drum for the Scots language in a big way because if I was, I would be aware of the fact that there was a Scots version of Wikipedia. But uh, the the post says, I've discovered that almost every single article in the Scots version of Wikipedia is written by the same person, an American teenager who can't speak Scots. And then underneath it says, edit, I've been told that the editor I've written about has received some harassment for what they've done. This should go without saying, but I don't condone this at all. And it's, I, I don't know, you know, it's always easier to criticise than it is to be constructive. But... Right. I, and more fun. I, I, and and I feel like it's it's really not funny that Scots Wikipedia has been made up by someone who doesn't know anything about Scots. But at the same time, I'm not going to like find out who that person is and trash their name. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not going to email them or tweet them and say, "Fuck you, dude! What are you doing to my life? like? Come on, man, get some perspective in your life. Who are the people <laughs> out there who yeah. are defending the Scots language by like trolling some? Clearly misguided, but ultimately, I would assume, well-meaning fan of the language. Like, yeah. Yeah. The internet's terrifying yeah. sometimes. It really is. Um, so, so that was the longest ever intro we've ever done before, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it really is the case that we should talk more often when we're not uh, recording episodes. Yeah. People, <laughs> so people have heard from me a bunch. So why don't you take it away this time? Cool. On to the words. Words, words, words. So, I had a conversation this week with one of my colleagues uh, in, in school. And we were talking about feeling... We were just having a generic teacher, uh, this, this shit is exhausting kind of chat. And my colleague said, I feel like I have about 20 tabs open in my brain. And I said to her, have you ever actually stopped and counted how many tabs you have open on your phone? And and she was like, oh, yeah, sometimes I have loads. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes I actually count. So I, I, I have two counts that I make. There's So I use an iPhone and things stay open unless you tell them not to be open, basically. And you can right. double click your home button and see all of the things that are open since the last time you bothered to close them. So my, my current record on that is uh, 35, right? Wow. 35 apps open in some way, shape or form that most of which I haven't really been aware that are still, still open. And the other thing is I like to keep account every now and again of the tabs that I have open in Safari on my phone. Because as a, a, a curious knowledge seeker, somebody who really loves to learn and gets annoyed when I can't find things out. Smartphones really are the, the best thing I could possibly imagine. 
oh, I wonder why this is the case. Yeah. Literally three seconds later, I can find out why that is the case. And and that's that's really, really exciting to me. Like I I still get excited by smartphones. I, I think that they're amazing. I think that it's absolutely incredible the capabilities that we have in our pockets pretty much as standard, you know, in in, in the sort of time and, and space that I'm occupying. Um so so when I do think about a thing, like if if I wonder about um the names of the bones in the foot. Or if I wonder about what the weather's going to be like someplace I might want to go, then quite often, if those things, if those searches throw up interesting answers, I don't necessarily have the time to engage with those interesting answers at that point. So I leave the tab open. You know, that's, that seems pretty straightforward and simple to me. Yeah. However, I realised this week that I have uh, nearly 60 tabs open on Safari Whoa. at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> and that that seemed excessive, even for me. <laughs> that seems slightly less reasonable. So the first one, the one right at the top, <clears throat> is uh, motions and muscles of the foot. That's one that's been there for a little while because the the feet are incredibly interesting to me uh, in, in one of my capacities. I've also got... Um, there are some etymology things open. So I've still got a couple of tabs open uh, from the, the question about maize versus corn. Yep. I have a tab about, uh, heel, it's called Heels by Number. It's about when you're knitting a sock, different ways to turn a heel. I've got, Jeez, okay. um, I've got a couple of books that people have recommended to me that I haven't gotten around to reading. Uh, an article by James Baldwin that someone sent to me that I really want to read, but I just haven't gotten to yet. Lots of stuff about uh, movement and anatomy. Some stuff about grammar, the complex sentence. Some mm, okay. online shopping, bits and pieces. Uh, supermarket shop. A whole load of research for uh, the yoga teacher training job that I have. And... Mm now Scottish robot and uh, coronavirus guidelines for, for various things, a page about sewing and a Google search for something that I quite frankly have forgotten why I even wanted to know what that thing was about. <laughs> so th this is just a little sample of the nearly 60 tabs that I currently have open on my phone. This is a bit crazy. And the, the long and the short of all this is I started to wonder where the word tab came from. It's oh. just a little tiny word. And yet there's actually quite a few places that, that we use it. So I, I had a look at the OED to see, because one of the things I love so much about the OED, and it sounds like an, an odd thing to appreciate about a dictionary because it's literally the reason that a dictionary exists, but there are so many <laughs> meanings for this word. So the, right. yeah. the OED lists six different noun meanings. So there are six entries for tab. Jeez. Nine, one to six. And most of them are fairly substantial entries. So the first one, noun one, tap, T-A-B. And the, the first sense of the word says a short strap or tongue and related uses. Which then goes to A, a short broad slap, strap, excuse me, flat loop or the like, attached by one end to an object or forming a short projecting part by which a thing can be taken hold of hung up, fastened or pulled in various applications. See quotations. This dates fr first from 1607 and we have how the horse is girt and by some special marks or observations about the tabs to know how his garth is to hold. Uh, a thing to hold on to, to fasten or grab another thing, basically. And, and so the meanings go on from there. We have leather tabs. We have tabs for bells and bell strings. We have the tab at the end of a belt. Tabs to pull up a lid. All that, that kind of thing. We then get a shoe latchet for fastening with a buckle, button or thong, which I, I find quite interesting. There's lots of really interesting words to do with shoes and shoemaking. And then we get a short strap attached at one end to the side of a coat or jacket or vest, having a buttonhole at the free end for fastening across. The metal end of a lace or a shoestring. 
the tongue of a shoe or a boot, the pool tab used to open a can of beer, mm -hmm. and then we get to, as an ornament of dress, each of the projecting square pieces formed by the cutting out by cutting out the lower edge of a jacket or other article of dress, or sewn onto its uncut edge, and usually embellished with buttons, embroidery, etc. So we get this sense of functional tab, and mm -hmm. then into kind of decorative tab. And this yeah, continues. Okay. Uh, in nineteenth century use, sewn on and variously adorned with buttons, beads, embroidery, etc. And then we get coloured tabs, as in uh, army usage. So a, a patch or a tab worn by a senior member of staff. And then a small piece of something. The word comes to be used for this. So in 1729, we have take three or four tabs of the whitest goose dung, put all in a quart of strong beer. I don't know what this recipe was for. It doesn't sound great. I'm not going to be honest. No, I'm not here for I'm this. I'm not going to be... Uh, yeah. Strong beer, uh, you know, I'm fond of strong beer, but I've never ever felt the urge to add goose dung to my strong beer. No, not it's so sort far. Of good as it is, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. So the 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 names continue, that the meanings continue. We have uh, technical and mechanical uses. So one of the revolving arms which lifts the beaters of a fooling mill, and a narrow projecting strip of metal along the inside of a hollow calico printing roller to secure it to its mandrels by means of a slot in the latter. And then in aeronautics, a usually hinged part of a control surface that serves to modify the action or response of the surface. We have luggage labels. We have an ear. Interest in this an, one. A tab, an ear? a piece of leather in the front of a boot, a latchet, the ear. Because if you think about it, ears oh. are, to the human head, small, sticky out, Protrusions, little tabs. little tabs that you can take hold of. So quite so, interesting. Not until eighteen eighty nine do we have this this sense, but I, I quite like that. Like, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong place. Eight, eighteen sixty six, we have the tab, the ear, um, and then we have the usage meaning a cigarette. This is one that I recall I've, from. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose those days, those teenage days, where. Cigarettes were things that people actually cared about, um, because you know it was it was yeah. cool to smoke and all that stuff. I was never cool, so I didn't ever like you know hide cigarettes in my school bag. But I, if you got any tabs, that was yeah, that's a a thing that I recall. That's interesting. I've never heard that that oh, term really? for a cigarette before. We then have to keeping tabs on someone. Oh, now yeah. this could be. An abbreviation of tablet, which I, f I find very interesting because mm -hmm. tablet sounds like it's an abbreviation, like piglet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, it could also just be, be short for table, table or an account to keep tabs on somebody. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and then okay. also a bill, like picking up the tab or paying the tab. And that gives right. us next throwing up a tab, like uh, running up a, an account or, or using credit. Yeah. The, I would have thought of the, the my first thought with the keeping tabs on someone was maybe going with the idea of a you know a a projected thing that lets you hold on to something like if if you're hold if you're holding on to something, like a tab makes it easier to grab and find yeah. something so like keeping tabs on someone I would have my brain immediately went to I wonder if it's hanging you know, on to them you're hanging yeah. on to them somehow yeah I don't know that's interesting but, oh, that's interesting I like that. The, the the entry for cigarette uh, says northern dialect and slang and the earliest citation for this is from 1934. And the, <laughs> interestingly, the citation says, have you got a tab on you? The only tabs I knew were connected with the theatre, but I discovered later that tab is a common name in the north for a cigarette. Uh, so, mm. yeah, I like that the citation is about someone saying it means what now? <laughs> it's helpful when yeah. that happens we then go on to a tablet or a pill specifically LSD as in a tab of acid Yeah, um, and we're still only on the first entry for tab there are, there are wow. uh, five more so we have very very quickly we've got uh, noun two an elderly woman or in Australian English a young woman or girl 
Oh, the Aussies. We've then got, noun three, university slang, a member of the University of Cambridge. Tab four, hmm. theatrical slang, which is referenced in that citation I was just talking about, uh, shortened for tableau curtain. Away from the tabs, okay. he's the same as ever. In other words, you know, with, without the background. So the tab curtains fell together as the girl and the man stood at arm's length from one another. Tab five, typewriting and computing. A tabulator key or a tabular stop used to preset the movement of the carriage cursor, etc., under the direction of the tabulator. In other words, the, the key that you find on your keyboard that jumps the cursor along a little bit. And noun six. Shortened from tabloid, it's believed. A short play or th sketch, typically a condensed version of a longer work. And this refers, th this is referred to in US theatre. It's given as historical, although the first citation for it is only from 1915. So a burlesque tab or a musical comedy tab. And then also a, a US English uh, meaning tab shortened for tabloid. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of ground to be covered for this very small, seemingly insignificant thing. The OED doesn't have anything to say directly about tabs on a phone, tabs on a computer. Although it, it does, of course, mimic the physical tabs that you would find in a filing yeah. cabinet. You know, that's, that's how, well, you know, I'm using Safari and Chrome organises its tabs in the same way. It, it's as though you're looking at a drawer of a filing cabinet and here are all the little pieces. So I was interested to see that there isn't a specific entry within its definitions to, to talk about its use in computing other than the tab key. That seems like it is probably something they're going to throw in there sometime soon. Get like to. that's yeah. cause That's been around for, I mean, not a long time by OED standards, but <laughs> I don't know, browser tabs have been a thing for a while now. Yeah, but but like as as I say, you know, I I thought the same thing. It's like, oh no, browser tabs, and then I realised that browser tabs aren't, a, you know, they're not a new thing. They're a a graphical That's representation true. of a very yeah. old thing. So does does that deserve a a new entry in the OED? Or I I certainly agree that it's it's interesting to compare the two. I mean, icon. You could say the same thing that. about a word like icon. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there are lots of usages within modern computing and, and you know, media use that that come from much, much older words. I don't know if they all have separate definitions yeah, or not. Yeah, I say not. that without having looked up Icon to make sure that it's actually in there in the computer <laughs> form. <laughs> so etymologically, yes. we have the, the wonderful, wonderful phrase, origin obscure. Nice. I'm not surprised that this word is of obscure origin for several reasons. Firstly because the word itself is a small, insignificant thing, a part of a thing that you may not even have considered as a separate part. Right, yeah. So I, I feel like, you know, the word tab is not a word that's been noticed a great deal. Yeah. This, is my, this is my hunch, entirely unscientific. So what the OED has to say is, origin obscure, at first a dialect word, it's not in Johnson's Dictionary, and in some senses, it may be short for tablet. In others, it interchanges with tag. Etym Online has, has similar, similar stuff to say about it. A small flap or strip of material is how they cite it from around about 1600, possibly from a dialectical word of uncertain origin. Often interchangeable with tag, T-A-G, mm -hmm. which hadn't really occurred to me, which is madness because they're literally one letter different. But... A tab and a tag in my head are, are not the same, so I've I've never really, I've never really kind of completed yeah. them. So tag is a bit earlier; it dates from around about fourteen hundred, according to Etym Online, and they reckon it comes probably from a Scandinavian source. So we have Norwegian tag with two G's, meaning point or prong or barb, and the Swedish tag again T A G G, meaning prickle or thorn relating to Middle Low German tag with an E on the end, meaning branch, twig or spike. Hmm. The sense development might be point of metal at the end of a cord or string, etc. Hence the part hanging loose. Or, I like this one, I, I, I don't know how much credence it, it would have uh, 
with proper etymologists. Etym Online says, or perhaps ultimately from Pi Dek, D E K. So you, you see a lot of uh, translation from D's into T's. You can, mm. if you say enough words starting with either T or D, you can see how that sim change has come about. Uh, so the Pi root Dek, meaning a root forming words referring to fringe, horsetail, locks of hair. Hmm. So the sense of a, a hanging down thing, a thing that can be taken hold of, that, that makes good etymological sense to yeah. me. There's another interesting point in the entry for tag on Etym Online. The second sense here given is the children's game, dating from around about 1738, hmm. and perhaps a variation of Scots, Tig. Now, I, I would never, ever call that game where you run after someone and try to touch them tag. It's completely foreign to me. In Scotland, we say tig. Oh, okay. Very much oh. so. And the, uh, tig means to touch or to tap. Oh, OK. Probably an alteration of Middle English, tick, T-E-K, touch or tap, like tick. The baseball sense is from 1912. And then this entire sentence is a big, bold link. It's not an acronym and doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, of course, who's not going to click on a link like that? Absolutely. <laughs> and this led me to a little article on Etym Online uh, that, that I really enjoyed. It's, it, the title of the article is Acronymphomania. Oh, I like that. <laughs> And and it refers to it refers to the notion of uh, <laughs> the first sentence says the latest appalling idiocy of the internet is that the name of the children's game tag is an acronym. <laughs> now, earlier you said I mean hate is a strong word, but my God, the frustration is palpable. <laughs> the Twitter bilge goes, "How old were you when you learned that the game tag stands for touch oh, and yeah. go?" <laughs> Backronyms are just so, so interesting to me because I don't understand why people yeah. want to make things needlessly complicated. <laughs> so this this very scathing and hilarious article, I I really really enjoyed it, and it goes through some of the reasons, uh, some of the reasons for the the nonsensical nature of backronyms. So, um, <laughs> one of the examples that's given, uh, it, it actually gives you a little checklist to say. How do you know if it's a, a real, if it's a backronym or if it's a real acronym? And so it's it's interesting. It, it's, you know, it's good common sense. So they have five points. Number one, look at the earliest form of the word. The meme that says shit is an acronym, founders on the old English form of the world, which began with, excuse me, of the word, which began with an SC. That doesn't fit the story. Right. So it says to look for the earliest form of the world. Why do you keep saying world for word? It says to look for relatives and cognates, which is, of course, uh, very sensible. To look at context. The example given there is that golf. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's a story saying gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. It says it's based on a 20th century social sensibility that would have been irrelevant to word formation in 15th century Scotland, where golf originates, as gouf, G-O-U-F, rather than golf. So... Uh, the Scots word was anglicised into golf. The acronym doesn't make any sort of sense. And then uh, look at dates, abbreviations that become words or new things. And this this was interesting. The article says most of them are kind of post-1941 and most of the rest are post-1914. Mm. And the, the wars are given, the respective wars are given as... Uh, good sort of indications that these are times when acronyms proliferate. And then the last one is Occam's razor applies. Yeah. The generators of fake etymologies often pick a word marked of uncertain origin in the dictionaries, but their acronym theory still has to pass the four questions above. Now, I, it's, it's just occurred to me, um, I, I wanted to talk about this. I've, I've actually been wanting to talk about this for a long time okay. because it's it's kind of new knowledge to me, but... Occam's razor, you know this principle, you know this, yeah. this phrase. Occam's razor basically says, look for the simplest possible explanation. I discovered that there is also a Hanlon's razor. Hmm. Now, this is 
of, of course it's of interest to me because my name is Hanlon. Hanlon is my married name, so I am really super excited to have married into uh, a razor family. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Hanlon's razor is, is pretty wonderful. You've probably seen this principle before. It's used frequently on the internet. And Hanlon's razor states, never attribute to malice that which can accurately be attributed to stupidity. Yes. I like that. <laughs> so, yeah, tag, tab, of uncertain origin, however, pretty ubiquitous. Yeah. It seems to me that it's perhaps one of these words that is used for all those words, all those things that we don't really have a name for. And whether that's happened by malice or by stupidity, I have no idea. <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> that's very cool. Um, yeah, those backrooms. I we're gonna I, send me the link to that because I'm gonna put that in the show notes so people can see that article because it's. I feel like it's important, but uh, yeah, it's it, the connection with tag is. Is interesting. I especially like the fact that in I think it was Swedish. It's like a specifically irritating little tickle or prickling thing. And it just makes me think of like <laughs> just like the tags on the back you have of your a new shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that's <laughs> man, the Swedes. They were right on with their furniture and meatballs and accurate depictions of what tags do to you. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. Sometimes it genuinely does feel as though you're being attacked by your own clothing. Yeah, it's terrible. Very cool. <laughs> um. So. Uh, I am going to talk about the word fear. Ooh. And uh, this is its sort of a short one, but I, I did find some kind of interesting things about this. It reminded me a little bit of when we talked about nightmare, which is okay. one of my favorite words to dive into, just because it, it sort of, yeah, it, the history of nightmare, like the history of the word fear, it, it sort of flipped on its head what it was talking about. So I'll, yeah, I'll just sure. jump right in. It, so fear dates back to Old English, which makes sense because you would sort of assume that a word for a very basic emotion would be very old. You know, people have been experiencing something akin to what we call fear now for quite some time, I would imagine. Yeah, and so sure. Of course there's a word for it. And of course it's very old. So it's Old English. The first citation is Beowulf. And it's... Now, I, I actually looked up a little, like, YouTube video on pronunciation of Old English. Oh, this is so, foxy. So, I say fair begayet is, I think, how it's... Fair begayet. But it's, like the, it's that A-E, and apparently that's supposed to be, like, the A in cat, so far. Far begayet. Yes, say okay. far begayet, I guess, but I don't know. Kevin Stroud's rolling his eyes, if he's even listening. Hello, Kevin. I, I love mangling yeah. Old English. I love it so much. Um, However, what's interesting is what it originally meant in Old English was a sudden and terrible event or peril. Ooh. And it wasn't until sort of the end of the 12th century. So you get to like 1190 something or other. And that's when it starts to be to take on the sense that the OED describes as the emotion of pain or uneasiness caused by the sense of impending danger or by the prospect of some possible evil. Oh, this so is lovely. Get, Keep first, going. You know, it's 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 the thing, and then it's the emotion worrying about the thing. But originally, it was the thing, and then of course it's it stayed more or less the same since the end of the twelfth century. Like just that sense of foreboding and the rest of the stuff. It's it's a Germanic, Scandinavian, Norse origin word, and it's interesting to look at what the ancestors of the word fear meant in the various Scandinavian languages, like the various cognates, because they're all obviously related, and you can definitely tell, you can see how they're related, but they're all just slightly different, and I just, I find it fascinating to think about what, if anything, that might say about the worlds that created these words. So, yeah, yeah. the old Saxon uh, antecedent to fear meant ambush, the old High German oh. meant stratagem or danger, as well as ambush. The old Norse meant misfortune or plague. 
And Gothic doesn't have a specific sort of version, but the derivative word that the OED lists meant liar in wait. And so it's the that's the fear. The fear is the thing that's either coming to get you or or I think worse, waiting for you. Because there's yeah. that sense of ambush. There somewhere. Who knows when, who knows yeah. where. But waiting. And it's interesting that Old Norse had that plague. Plague was the fear. Mm. In Old Norse. And so and this the 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 goose dung in beer really cemented it for me. The past was a terrible place. Like, <laughs> what an appalling thing that we have all been through as a species to get here. Like, this is bad, this current yeah. moment. Like, people bitch and whine about 2020, but nobody's putting goose crap in your beer now. <laughs> Least of all, you. You know, like, imagine being in a place where you thought that was a good idea. So... I, I remember that the, the first time it occurred to me that the past was a terrible, terrible place was when I was oh maybe maybe about 13, 14 and uh, doing an investigation at school into uh, Roman medicine. Oh, just... And discovering... Well, I've, I've talked about that in the past, uh, trepanning. Yeah. Like, the Romans drilled holes in people's skulls. Yeah. Anesthesia didn't exist. Until all the Romans were fossils. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, and they did that to help. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just, exactly. And, I, and, and I, this is, and the other thing is, I'm, I'm saying this, like, the past is an awful place. I'm saying this as, like, a middle to upper middle class, white, straight dude. So. Yeah. I, I was going to get the best the past had to offer me. Now, I had terrible eyesight as a you kid. Would, so I you would get the quality goose dung. I was dude. nothing but the best, <laughs> finest white goose dung. But <laughs> now I, I had glasses as a kid. So anytime before the 20th century, I would have just been a blind beggar from birth because they would have thrown me out because I couldn't see. But That's okay. I, I, I'm a woman. Well, that's just so what I'm saying. I, like, I would be fucked. If it it would have been terrible for me. <laughs> but man, what an awful place the past was. Anyway, so that's... And I had I had just I had been reading about this whole fear thing, how it was like all this stuff that was happening to you was the actual fear, and then the goose dung and beer thing really pushed me over the edge. Um, <laughs> what if, anyway, do what you like to Ryan, but don't mess with his beer. Oh, especially strong beer. You got a good strong beer. You're gonna put anyway. Ugh. Um, so, by and large, that's kind of the story of fear. So because it it sort of hasn't done a whole lot over the last, you know, eight or nine hundred years in terms of sense change. So you do get certain yeah, applications fear, fear, of it. So you get um, like the fear of God, putting the fear of God into okay. someone. And that that's you get a kind of a tinge of not like pure dread or actual fear, but there's like some reverence in there a little bit. There's like so anyway, it's it's a really minor change, but it you know what I found interesting about that phrase, specifically the put the fear of God into someone, is that the earliest citation of that in the OED is actually to rub the fear of God into someone. No. And that just does not sound as scary to me. Like, <laughs> it sounds, I mean, it sounds creepier, but, <laughs> but, but not as actually scary, you know? <laughs> I'm a I'm a massage therapist, and uh, I I've I've I know a fellow massage therapist who will talk about oh I'm needing a good rub, yeah, and like essentially <laughs> that is what a massage therapist does to you, like a a big part of the treatment will involve some form of rubbing, yeah. but we do, we don't call it that, no. and I think there's a good reason why we don't call it that because you're correct it just sounds a bit. <laughs> yeah, so you can rub the fear of rub God. Rub the fear of God. Or you used to be able to. Wow. Yeah, so that's weird. Um, <laughs> the, uh, See, I'm now imagining where does one rub in order to... Yeah, what's the best place to rub the fear of God to, to in someone? transfer the place of God at which part should be like rubbed. I have ideas, but I'm not saying any of them. How? Um, How should the rubbing take place? Is it like a brisk... Is it vigorous? I have so many questions. Is it gradual? I don't know. Yeah, it's exactly... There's so many different (laughs) questions about this. Um, It's also interesting that it... When I noticed and looked into the whole fear used to mean the fear thing that you were afraid of, it 
immediately mm-hmm. called to mind that, that Roosevelt line, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And it yeah, turns it should. a little more pragmatic than philosophical when it's like, <laughs> if he knew about that stuff. Um, now, the uh, people will note that I haven't actually talked about the etymology yet, and I guess that's sort of what we do. So, um, But it's because there's, there's a bit of a disagreement as far as where this comes from. So both Edom Online... Oh, fight, 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 fight. <laughs> Brilliant. Edom Online... Nothing I like better than the thought of, of etymologists shaking down. Absolutely, just in a parking lot somewhere. <laughs> Dictionaries and thesauruses just like... S- street countdown. Glinting in the streetlights. Um, yeah. Edom Online and the American Heritage Dictionary both sort of trace it to a pie root. Per, P-E-R, meaning to try or to risk. Now, we came across this with pirate. Yes. Because pirate is one of the uh, cognates from this uh, from this pie root. Episode 20, for those keeping track. Uh, other cognates with this root include peril, empirical, as in based on yeah, experimentation, and also experiment, mm-hmm. experience, and expert all come from this to try or to risk uh, pie root. However, the OED throws a little wrinkle into that. It The little Ooh. line at the end of its etymology section says that the base, quote, is probably one of the albloat forms of the Aryan root pair to go through. But the genesis of the sense is not clear. The current comparison with, and it gives a couple Greek Latin words, uh, meaning trial, attempt, risk, seems to be misleading. Now, it doesn't go mm. beyond that as far as why it seems to be misleading or what's misleading about it. And the other two, and of course, like the Aryan root pair has to go through. And so there's it's the same spelling of the root, but just a, a slightly different sense. And it's definitely the more the more prevalent uh, sense of that root or different root because it's got a lot more cognates with that uh, than the try or risk. So to to go through as to endure? Yeah, I guess so. I guess that would be the... But that's, like to experience? I guess that's why it says sort of the, the sense... The sense genesis isn't super clear so i guess what i guess the idea is that the there are other um there are problems with it that are more technical having to do with the actual sort of mechanics of language chains and morphological Mm -hmm. shifts and all that other stuff that is all that really cool scary stuff that we it's beyond the realm of real etymologists uh, but where yeah. it falls down is the fact that it's it's kind of hard to to go okay well how do you how do you make that square with the sense of it all and then mm. vice versa i think that's probably where it, when it says it seems misleading is that there's probably something about the usage or the morphology etc that makes it difficult for the trial and risk one but anyway so that's uh fear awesome i love the notion of the only thing to fear is fear itself making good etymological sense. Yeah, I like that as like, well. He's like, yeah. He was accidentally accurate. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was. I, I had a conversation this week with, with one of my pupils who I, I already like a lot purely because we had this conversation where he said, but, but that's just the same thing said two different ways. And I said, actually, not quite. And so we we did a bit of nitpicking as to why the two things that had been said were similar, but that they they had a different nuance. Yeah. And after which he said, English is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I laughed and agreed with him. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon.